according to the National Petroleum Authority NPA price buildup published on this website, there are about 12 margins and levies on one liter of petrol or diesel that you buy. These are energy debt recovery levy, 49 pesos, road fund levy, 48 pesos, energy fund levy, 1 peso, price stabilization and recovery levy, 14 pesos, sanitation and pollution levy, 10 pesos, energy sector recovery levy, 20 pesos, special petroleum tax, 46 pesos, primary distribution margin, 11 pesos, boss margin, 9 pesos, fuel market margin, 5 pesos, marketer's margin, 46 pesos, dealer's margin, 30 pesos. If you add all 12 margins and levies imposed on the liter of petrol or diesel, you get a total of 4 CDs, 25 pesos. What this means is that with the price of a liter of petrol or diesel at the pumps selling at 7 CDs, 99 pesos maximum, out of that, 4 CDs, 25 pesos are all taxes. That is over 50% of the price of a liter of petrol or diesel at the pumps, all made up of taxes and levies. With the current tensions between Russia and Ukraine, which has led to crude oil prices increasing over $100 per barrel, should government consider reducing some taxes? Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Security, Nanamwesi the seventh, believes government should. We are not saying introduce subsidies here in Ghana because we have a price, the present uh, environment has been deregulated, which is good. We don't push for uh, any subsidies. But then, what is the role of the price stabilization and recovery levy? It has not been able to effectively hold price. But the same fund was used by Egypt to hold their prices because they, just, they, they didn't just look at the levy, they look at the fund. So there's money sitting in there. We can tap into that to bring relief to Ghanaians. One positive thing for us to see price on international market go up is that because Ghana is also an oil exporting country, we'll get more revenue from our oil sales. The benchmark price set for 2021 and uh, 22 was um, $61.23 per barrel. Today, it's more than $100 per barrel. Let's say it's $100 per barrel. You see a clear windfall of close to $38 per barrel. And if should, price should stay around the same uh, you know, margin, then of course we are making a lot of money from our crude oil sales. That can compensate for any removal or suspension of taxes of levy and margins on a little of fuel. But chair of the oil and gas sector of the Association of Ghana Industries, Kwame Jantua argues, government may not cut down taxes. When you look at the price build up, there's nothing in the price build up that government can change today. And the only way, nothing. The thing they could probably look at is the UPPF. But even that, when the transporters are transporting refined petroleum products for BOST to go to the depots, they need to, to be paid. There needs to be money there for them to be paid. Not unless we have a system where the, 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 the refined petroleum products that come in go through a pipeline. And that's a different kettle of fish. In the midst of all this, question is, what difference would a functioning refinery have made in such turbulent times? We're having to import finished products, and that has raised concerns. What are the plans to revive the fortunes of this refinery behind me here? The Tema Oil Refinery, situated about 24 kilometers east of the capital, Accra, was originally named the Ghanaian Italian Petroleum Company and incorporated as a private limited liability company under the company's ordinance CAP 193 on December 12, 1960. It was 100% owned by the ENI Group of Italy. Unfortunately, Tor is in a coma and uh, we don't know when it's coming back. If they were refining our indigenous crude, one advantage Tor will have gotten is the freight cost because they will not be sourcing the crude oil from far. We have lost out on that. It will interest you to know that um, we say every economy, you've seen price on every, in every country going up. It is not true. Prices of fuel in Egypt from February last year to this year 
a stagnant, almost stagnant. In April 1977, the government of Ghana bought all the shares of the Ghanaian Italian Petroleum and became the sole shareholder. The name of the refinery was then changed to the Tema Oil Refinery in 1991. The refinery covers a total area of 440,000 square meters. President Kuma, he invited the Russians in to come and see whether Ghana had oil, and this was onshore. They drilled nine wells and hit oil, but President Kuma told them to cap those wells because we didn't have the money then. The Cold War was raging. We had already got the Akusumbu Dam, you know, money for the Akusumbu Dam, which was heavy money, and really, we couldn't go into an oil uh, production uh, situation. And so, in, with, in, in his mind, he felt Ghana one day would discover oil. And if we discover oil, in that area of being able to have our own, we need an oil refinery. Now, the thing about an oil refinery has got to do with the throughput and the feedstock. It's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a structure that needs constant feedstock, constant oil. And so Tor, at that time, the 1960s, was a tolling facility where they were bringing in oil from all the places to refine it. And it was the only refinery in the entire continent of Africa at the time. And President Nkrumah didn't envisage Tor to be what he built it to be at that time, to be the same as today. The products of the refining process were liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, gasoline, illuminating and cooking kerosene, aviation turbine kerosene, gas oil or diesel, and residual oil. You are producing below your capacity and you are not competitive. Then the type of configuration that you have, what type of product can you crack within one, uh, you know, one barrel? Can you get a lot of streams of products, LPG, NAFTA, this, all the way to coal tar? Then you know that you are creaming everything that you have to cream out of one product, uh, out of one barrel. Tor cannot do that. So the configuration is a challenge, but that, that's even on the, on, the, on the lighter side. But your production capacity per day, as is against installed, and your output, annual output, are key to determine how competitive you are. In 1977, as part of the first phase of Tamar Refinery's expansion and modernization program, the Crude Distillation Unit, CDU, was revamped to 45,000 barrels per stream. In 2002, as part of the second phase of the expansion and modernization program, a residual fluid catalytic cracking RFCC unit of capacity 14,000 barrels per day was commissioned. You need to look at, so what happened after 1966 coming forward? Unfortunately, the kinds of investment that Torn needed wasn't put in. Two, politicians from that period onwards used as a political football as if they didn't understand what the reason for Tor was. It didn't, it, did, it didn't get the kind of fix because at that time we didn't have oil. The second phase began in April 1990 at an estimated cost of $36 million. The area where Tor was placed is quite huge. And it was supposed to be placed near an area where we had fresh water. Ada was one place and Tema was another. And Tema seemed to have won that bid. So his intention was long term. Ghana will find oil one day and will have a refinery to refine our own uh, uh, petroleum. Also, apart from Ghana being able to refine their own, 
he was also looking at how Ghana can serve Africa with regards to refined petroleum products. So that was the objective of why President Nkrumah uh, established TOR. Ghana started commercial production of crude oil in December 2010. The country's Jubilee oil fields produces the high-grade sweet light crude. TOR received their first parcel and the only parcel of indigenous crude from the tenfold. It was supplied by AOT aboard a vessel called uh, MT Bodiera in December 2016. It was refined and it was good. Since then, Tor has not been able to do anything like that. By proximity, crude supply from Ghana's uh, you know, uh, uh, fields to Tor will be uh, you know, less expensive than hauling it from far away Russia or Nigeria. So that's, you know, freight costs can be, you know, a form of uh, cushioning for tall pricing its products. With the discovery of more oil wells and gas in Ghana, since 2010, the company had the objective of positioning itself to expand and improve infrastructure to ensure reliability of petroleum products on the Ghanaian market and to export to the ECOWAS sub-region. The Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GNPC, is also in the process of acquiring more commercial interest for Ghana in the oil sector. Which has happened to Ghana, not just GNPC, by increasing our stake in the, in the Jubilee fields, Jubilee and 10 fields. Yeah. At least a chance to buy 7% more increases Ghana's stake to about 20%, which hitherto was not the case. It is a commercial interest. And for us in GMPC, it's a good thing. Once we can pay the cost associated with production, we get a free-flowing uh, cash that we can use for, for so many things. Um, I think the, the president has done very well in getting us to move that direction. And this is very consistent with what GMPC is trying to do uh, with an acre block and other matters. So um, it's a first step. And we, we, I think we, we, there's justification for what we are doing and we'll continue to do it and improve in what we do. And it gives us additional basis that we can use, to, we can leverage on to borrow. We are going to be part of the joint operating group as part of the joint operating group by this acquisition. So we're going to learn something from there. But then I think our, our eyes are on the bigger picture that we've uh, painted over the last few months. Is there a plan for the Tamari refinery to leverage on this? Unfortunately, a number of factors, including the politics and recent reports of corruption at the Tamari refinery. We know the interim management committee set up by the president to look into the affairs of toll, um, develop a strategy for, you know, um, going forward. They were given a period of our four months to do and deliver their results. It's been barely a year. There's no other news we've received from this interim management committee, aside the story of some thefts that they published. And you see that it was, it was calculated that at the end of the four or five months, that's when they released that news. For you to get a feeling that something is being done at all to an earth a rot here and there. For that very situation, we already know. It's a public knowledge. It's nothing new. But then a strategy to turn around a key entity like Tor that can be placed in the equation of our fuel supply and uh, price risk. That very strategy is missing. There is nothing new in there. We have not had any positive thing in there. It's just the normal internal ranking as to who will be the MD of Tor. Getting news that some members of the Interim Management Committee want to be part of management or the board. And so you clearly see a system um, where there's total confusion. For some time now, has not refined crude as it was built to do. The last time Tor did crack crude was, um, let's say about nine months ago, roughly, let me put it that way barely a year ago, that's the last time. And you see, if you have a refinery, what makes it profitable is hinged on about three key factors. Your economies of scale is overarching 
factor. But then that's within that economy of scale, you should ensure that you have good production capacity to be competitive. Some refineries are cracking 1 million barrels a day. You are cracking 25,000 barrels a day. The overhead costs, it will impact on you negatively. And so TOS in stock capacity has plunged from 45,000 to 25,000 because only one furnace is working. That is a disadvantage for TOR. We think that TOR has a role to play and uh, just that we're not living the Nkrumah dream. It, is, it has fizzled out. And um, from what we are picking on the ground, TOR is almost dead. Government had in time passed made a proposal to convert the refinery into a tank farm. But this is the Energy Minister, Dr. Matthew Pokoprempe, outlining government's plan for the refinery during his vetting. Tor and its crippling debts, and its money, infrastructure issues, equipment issues, uh, it's all over. Uh, uh, and we need, as a country, to only know one thing. Since the Fourth Republic, every president has talked about value addition of our natural resource. It just so happens that the last natural resource the good Lord gave us, which is oil, we already have a refinery to be able to add value. But since, interestingly, since we started mining oil commercially, uh, the refinery seems to be losing its ability to do its work. Uh, so we should collectively, apart from the debt overhang, which is nearly a quarter of a billion, we should collectively decide that we don't want to lose stock. We have to find the right partnerships, managerial infrastructure, equipment, to enable TOR to work and also invite other refineries into the system to make it even better. But like you said, the challenges are everywhere. They even, people owe them, they are not able to collect. They owe them, they also owe people who are on their necks trying to even take part of their business. John Jenapo is ranking member of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. We have crude oil here in Ghana. We produce about 180,000 barrels per day, close to 200,000. That alone is more than enough to meet our daily demand. Tor can process about 65,000 barrels of crude every day. I do admit that Tor has challenges, but that is why people are voted into power. We are voted into power to solve cha those challenges. So I think the government should turn an eye towards Tor. We cannot allow Tor to be in its current state. Something must be done about it so that we can process our own crude and then feed the domestic market. That will also bring some cushion. Matter of fact, the Tamar refinery had the objective or the plan to export petroleum products to the ECOWAS sub-region. That was the plan of the refinery after oil was discovered in commercial quantity in 2007. You see that behind me. With the geopolitical development in Russia and Ukraine leading to an increase of crude oil prices on the world market, what is the plan to cushion Ghanaians against the impact on the local pumps? Countries that produce oil and um, natural gas were not producing to meet what demand is calling for. Because over the last two, three years when COVID struck, there have been less investment into production, uh, producing fields. And so we are getting under production and we have increase, increasing uh, fuel and oil demand. Then this uh, geopolitics was also introduced. And if you know what uh, Russia does to Europe and to the global economy, you will conclude on the spot that it will impact on every economy because Russia supply, uh, you know, uh, more than 30% of what Europe needs in terms of energy, uh, oil and fuels. On the global scale, they, together with um, Qatar and US, control 70% of the natural gas market. So they are a key player in, scheme, in the scheme of um, oil supply and fuel supply. And let's pray that this rocket firing doesn't hit any pipeline 
in that jurisdiction that supply uh, fuel as well. It wasn't the situation. With the structure and nature of our economy, when prices of petroleum products go up at the pumps, it affects the prices of almost all goods and services on the market. Hence, prices of goods and services will go up in the coming days, all things being equal, unless there is an intervention by government. Fuel prices and oil prices will go up because supply will be squeezed. And already, that has been, um, you know, factored into the pricing by the oil traders. Then, when the demands get more squeezed, oil supply to our part of the world would definitely also be battered. And so we are, we are faced with a possible oil supply challenge, and we have seen the immediate impact on the surging price of fuels and oil on the world market.